estamos empezando nada más que con una hora de retraso esta sesión. Eh, eh, he moderado muchas veces paneles, pero esta vez fue sin duda la peor. Eh, pero bueno, eh, tampoco, nunca se me pasó una hora. Pero bueno, circunstancias excepcionales. Eh, la, 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 vamos a la, lamentablemente el, el, el tiempo dedicado a este panel se va a cortar porque luego tenemos que continuar con las sesiones cerradas de la, de la round table eh, la, eh, la sesión que, que, que tengo el placer de moderar es sobre eh, la teoría y la historia de eh, la prevención y manejo de las crisis de deuda eh, esta sesión se organiza para aquellos que no estuvieron a la mañana, vuelvo a repetir lo que mencioné antes, o repito lo que mencioné antes, eh, esta es una, eh, una mesa redonda eh, que organiza la International Economic Association, que es la Federación de Asociaciones de Economistas a nivel mundial, eh, junto con la eh, Asociación Argentina de Economía Política, que, eh, que es la, la pata local de, de la International Economic Association, es, eh, eh, y eh, la Facultad de Ciencias Económicas está eh, agradecida y tiene el honor de ser el lugar en donde esta eh, mesa redonda se está llevando adelante. Eh, la mesa redonda tiene una serie de sesiones cerradas que, eh, donde se discuten los temas vinculados con, con la cuestión de las crisis de deuda y una serie de paneles abiertos. Eh, tuvimos el primero con el señor Ministro de Economía y el profesor José de Stiglitz, y ahora estamos empezando el segundo, en el cual nos acompañan cuatro prestigiosos economistas y académicos, eh, a los cuales voy presentando a, a medida que, que vayan hablando. Y eh, vamos a comenzar con el profesor Axel Dionco, quien ya ha visitado nuestra facultad en muchas otras ocasiones, y tiene una gestión de admiradores aquí en la. En la, en, la, en la facultad. Eh, el profesor Leon Bud es eh, profesor emérito de, de la Universidad de California de Los Ángeles y eh, profesor de la Universidad de Trento en, en Italia. Eh, ah, oh, también, también emérito en Trento. Okay. Ah, bueno, y es uno de los macroeconomistas más importantes de, 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 de campo, así que es una persona bastante conocida y sin más, entonces te voy a dar la palabra y te voy a pedir que hablen 20 minutos cada uno para no irnos eh, totalmente fuera de, de control, si no traen las empanadas y comemos mientras sigue la, la charla. Eh, ¿Axel? So this session is on the prevention and management of debt crisis, and that's a large uh, problem, and we have already run out of time. Uh, unfortunately, I'm Swedish, which means I, I speak at a rate about uh, one third of other participants here, but I will try uh, to run through uh, a few points as quickly as I am able. Uh, so. First, prevention. Uh, first thing to say is uh, to think that we will see the next one coming down the road and we'll, uh, that we will be able to act in time to stop it is, uh, I think, an illusion. There's been much talk about uh, macroprudential supervision and uh, we have a new board, for example, at the BIS in Basel, who's supposed to do that. Uh, But the truth is, uh, we don't have the methodology for microprudential supervision. And uh, a body like that will not, in my opinion, uh, be able uh, to uh, issue warnings in good time that will elicit enough uh, uh, confidence in policy makers actually to get any action. Uh, at the same time, uh, We cannot afford uh, to go through another crash like the fund uh, starting in 2007 08 and that we are still uh, suffering from. Because uh, uh, most 
governments of consequence do not have the resources, uh, fiscal resources, to deal with another crash. So uh, the question is uh, what to do about the making the system safe. Uh, first, my first topic is monetary control, how to conduct monetary policy. The monetary policies in the years leading up to the crash were disasters. Why was that? Um, basically, it was trust in inflation targeting as uh, the way to conduct monetary policy, in my opinion. Uh, think back to uh, metallic standards. Uh, under the metallic standards, you had convertibility uh, into the monetary metal as the underlying uh, guarantee of control of the price level. Uh, then you had the central bank's bank rate uh, to control uh, uh, credit, the growth of credit. Now, in recent theory, uh, dynamics, stochastic, general equilibrium, and so on, uh, you used inflation, you used uh, the interest rate, interest targeting to control the price level. And in those models, uh, there is an equation, the transversality condition, uh, that was supposed to control credit, to guarantee that at the end of time, all loans will be repaid. And the trouble with, the, with those theories is that that particular condition has no counterpart in the real world. Uh, so we were left with um, uh, one instrument, the interest rate, and two goals. And that, as we know very well, at least since the time of Tinberg and Von Du. 50 years ago, uh, there was a debate, and I'm among the survivors here who remember it. <laughs> um, the main protagonists were Erwin Shaw and Patinkin, and they discussed what the requirements for uh, monetary and credit control. And to put it very briefly, the conclusion of that debate was that you need to control one interest rate in the economy and you have need to control uh, one nominal stock. And what we have done wrong then recently is we thought we could get along with controlling just the interest rate. Uh, my proposal at present would be, uh, so not, you need to add control of a monetary magnitude to the interest rate. Well, uh, suppose you could control the monetary base and bring back effective reserve requirements. Uh, and those reserve requirements should be imposed on all issuers of demand or overnight liabilities. We let reserve requirements slip because um, uh, money market funds were not subject to them and uh, reserve requirements on uh, commercial banks uh, turned out to be uh, sort of an unfair tax as it were on the banking system, so we let them slip. In addition then, you will have to make bank reserves a scarce good. Um, and that would be then a, a control of a nominal magnitude in addition to control of an interest rate. The problem is, how would we get there from here? The bubble was caused, with some simplification, by, low, by interest rates that were kept too low or too long. Uh, what we have been doing in the last couple of years is trying to cure the consequences of that error by still lower interest rates, which is not necessarily an intuitive <coughs> medicine to administer. Uh, the central bank's balance sheets have doubled, and in the case of the Fed, tripled uh, with this policy. And uh, bank 
so now paying interest rates on reserves in addition. Now I think you should uh, reflect that uh, with this policy we have abandoned time-honored rules by Badger uh, for how to administer uh, a lender of last resort. Uh, <coughs> we are uh, not imposing a penalty rate on, on the banks that we are uh, aiding. We are doing the opposite. We are subsidizing them as much as we can. We are certainly not insisting that the lending that central banks do to the banks is on the basis of good collateral because the central banks are taking on so all sorts of junk. So getting out of this mess uh, into a, a situation uh, where uh, monetary policy will be uh, uh, on a sound basis, providing both a quant control of a quantity and of an interest rate from where we are today will be difficult. Regulation. Um, the common philosophy that's debated all the time uh, is basically we have to prohibit uh, the banks from doing things they want to do. And we have to mandate that they do some things they do not want to do. And uh, we have a plethora of proposals of that nature. Uh, what I would like to see uh, is a change in, in the philosophy with which we approach this problem. The alternative would be to change what bank bankers will want to do and what they do not want to do, which is to say, change the incentives that bankers face. How do you do that? Well, uh, pay bank executives with uh, equity, but have that equity carry double liability, let us say, so that if the bank fails, not only do they lose uh, the value of that equity, but they also are liable for an equal amount in addition to cover the bank's uh, uh, unpaid liability. Uh, that may sound like a, a radical idea to you, but the truth is that in the history of banking, uh, in early banking, uh, bank owners had unlimited liability. Uh, double liability was the rule for uh, most U.S. banks uh, prior to the Great Depression of the 30s. In California, where I live, uh, banks had triple liability, so that if the bank went under, uh, the bank owners were, uh, lost their equity and then were liable for twice the value of the equity that they had been holding to satisfy liability. Uh, it's, big, it's clear, I think, that present incentives for bankers are badly skewed uh, from a public policy standpoint. In my lifetime, uh, the culture of banking has changed completely. Uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz the other day quoted uh, uh, the old line which I have also been using, but uh, I was reflecting upon it uh, the other night, uh, that the rule of banking used to be don't lend, uh, to, to, uh, don't give credit to people who need it. Well, uh, obviously, uh, bankers nowadays uh, are violating that all the time. They're pushing credit on people who better not have it. Uh, the prudent banker of yesterday has been replaced by uh, uh, Wall Street types that are basically high-flying, big betting, dead setters. And that is not an inexplicable social development. Uh, it changed because the <coughs> environment in which bankers operate has changed. And the big change in the United States has really been uh, the conversion uh, 20 years ago of investment banks from partnerships to limited liability corporations that have turned uh, 
prudent, cautious, conservative institutions into uh, in terms of iniquity and, uh, and uh, betting, high betting. Um, how do you, that's the two topics I have under the heading of, of uh, prevention. A few points about managing that crisis. First, how to think about it. I, <clears throat> I like to think of uh, uh, the contracts outstanding at any one point in time that govern most of what people do in the, in the uh, economy on any given day. It's true that today I have a choice of what I eat when I go to a restaurant. But for the most part, and for the important part, uh, uh, what you do is, uh, is governed by contracts that you've entered into or by, uh, by uh, uh, less formal understandings with counterparties. Now this verb of contracts um, can, can uh, uh, develop over time uh, a crucial instability. And the two aspects of that make it unstable and high leverage on the one hand and maturity mismatch on the other. Uh, plus, as was revealed in the crash, not a little fraud. <coughs> An ordinary default, when somebody defaults, uh, most often the, um, uh, the loss is absorbed by the creditor. But one default can lead, can lead to the creditor defaulting in turn. And if the system is uh, uh, fragile in the Minsky sense, uh, one default can start an avalanche of defaults. Uh, those can be bigger or, st or, st or, or, or smaller. Uh, the one we have been faced with is one of basically global instability of the web of contracts. There are two. There are two forms of this sort of instability. One is debt deflation. And the logical end of that is a state where all the claims outstanding are really not, un are uncollectible. And the debts that people have are unpayable because the real value in relation to their incomes is, is impossible. And the opposite collapse of the web of contract is one that Argentines of my age, at least, uh, uh, remember quite well. It's one where uh, the nominal debts out there are trivial and basically uh, are worthless, uh, uh, trivial to pay, and the claims are, are worthless. Uh, both of these processes, as you can see when you consider the extremes, are uh, processes where, and this is a phrase that Daniel Heyman and I have used a lot, uh, broken promises are, are uh, the dominant uh, aspect of, of it. Uh, and the fact that broken promises dominate mean that you enter into periods of severe political instability and social anomie which makes it uh, of utmost urgency that you try to stop uh, uh, these processes of a collapsing web of contact. Stopping an avalanche midway, uh, however, means that you stop contract law to run its course, because if you let the law run its course, the whole system collapses. <clears throat> so how do you do that? Well, you do it with haircut bailouts, public deficits, and maybe by, by inflating. Uh, all of which has, uh, uh, of course, distributed consequences. Once an avalanche is stopped, the question becomes one of the diagnoses. Is the basic problem that we're dealing here one with of the insolvency of lots of, of the parties involved? Or is the main problem that people are illiquid? 
or rather, how much of each do you have? That line is never clear. Um, it's never quite obvious where the line goes. What you do know is that it will shift, depending on whether you get growth or contraction, or whether you get inflation or deflation. Suppose yeah, you know that you have a pure case of insolvencies being the underlying problem. Then the policy would basically mean confronting the distribution of questions directly. But these are questions which only have politically unpalatable answers that the polity would like to avoid of the type. Who does and who does not get paid? and who will be made to pay for the debts of others, and so on. Suppose you have a pure case of illiquidity, that the only trouble out there is that uh, um, the financial institutions and others have been caught with severe maturity mismatches. Well, then the option number one is pump in the stuff. Uh, just inject the liquidity and then debtors will have time to earn their way out of the, the holes that they have dug for themselves. Now, the great temptation for policymakers today uh, has been, uh, let's believe that it's all just a matter of liquidity. So we use monetary policy, and that's all, maybe, maybe that's all we need to do. Well, it works in some cases. It doesn't work in others. Uh, it worked to uh, let the, the US banks earn their way out of uh, the Latin American uh, lending fiasco they had gotten into 30 years ago. But often it does not work. One of the problems is that the financial crisis tend to bisect the financial system into two sets of agents. I, I tend to think of it as sort of an sipping of the, of the uh, uh, financial system. You divide it into solvent and liquid agents over here and illiquid agents threatened by insolvency over here. And the situation is one where the first set won't lend to the second. The problem is, conventional central bank operations mean uh, you trade with the first set. And when this bisection has gone very far, that monetary policy will be peculiarly ineffective. It will not work as it does in normal times. It will uh, not do much to stimulate that. <coughs> So, if it's not just the liquidity, option two, Keynesian deficits. There's a reminder that I find I have to tell people all the time. When you think about Keynesian policies in the present circumstances, you have to realize there's nothing about default problems in the general theory. Keynes was writing about Great Britain in the early 30s, not about the state of the United States at the same time. So there's nothing in the general theory that faces up to uh, the problems of our society with much before. <coughs> The broken promises of a credit crisis produces political polarization, and that makes it difficult to sustain an effective program, uh, which leaves option free. Explicit decisions on the distributive <coughs> options on how to restructure. And um, fortunately, my time has run out. <laughs> I don't have to deal with a really difficult way. <laughs> Gracias.
Disculpa si no es una vista, se apologiza por... Si me voy con el schedule, pero... Miren sus bolsillos a ver si no les han sacado algo para la opción 3 y le damos la palabra a Marcos Miller, que es director del eh, Centro de eh, Center for Study of Globalization and Regionalization de la Universidad de Warwick en Gran Bretaña y también un, un prestigioso especialista en temas de macroeconomía. Gracias. Learn from the lessons of Argentina's experiences of um, devaluation and default, debt destruction, and see how what they find for uh, Europe at the present time. Uh, we obviously had some detail this morning uh, from the minister, and um, uh, I want to focus mainly on debt destruction uh, rather than on the uh, debt right down. I'm not sure how much I should have repeated what I just said. Did you hear anything at all? Uh, so I, I want to focus on the debt restructuring uh, rather than the debt right down. As you know, Greece has written down a lot of its debts, but for countries like Spain and Italy, which have very large amounts of debt, um, in the case of Italy it's 100% of GDP, the stock of debt, uh, the issue is more to do with um, restructuring, trying to get some relief from interest payments which can go as high as 7%. Uh, so that's what I want to focus on. Are there ways in which you can give countries like Italy and Spain some breathing space by restructuring their debt? And as Professor Stiglitz said, uh, quite often for ordinary corporations uh, in the United States and other countries, uh, you go to a bankruptcy court judge, and if the judge believes that your company has good growth prospects, he will rearrange the line of structure of the company in order to make it, to give it breathing space. Right. Typically, typically uh, this involves what's called a debt equity swap. Uh, the government, the company retires some of its debt and issues equity instead. Now, of course, for, for nation states, uh, they don't typically issue equity. Uh, what Argentina has shown is that you can issue instead growth bonds, bonds whose payments depend on the growth rate of the economy. So if the economy is not growing, it doesn't pay any interest. If it does grow, it pays more than the growth rate. So that was, a, that was the innovation that um, Argentina introduced uh, in, in the early 2000s. In 2005, in fact, in a debt swap. So the question is, could you have such an innovation for Europe today? Now, there, there is a problem, which is that uh, when a country is in trouble, it's not the best time to introduce a, a financial innovation. People think that you'll never grow again. That was the view, I think, in the early 2000s for Argentina. But Argentina turned around and grew at 5%. Right now, it looks as if people think Greece will never grow again. So that's problem number one. Uh, th there's also uh, another issue which I, I want to raise, which is the fact that, as Professor Stiglitz said, people are taking their money away from Spain, away from Italy, and putting it into Germany. So how can we reverse this capital flight, this flight for safety? So we have to solve two problems. How to essentially help the borrowing countries, the debtors, with more flexible instruments of debt. And secondly, how to please the creditors by persuading them not to run, not to fly from Greece, Italy, Spain, to Germany or Britain. Uh, now, I believe you can solve both problems at once. So my proposal is not on the monetary side, more on the debt side, is to try to solve both these problems at once. 
by creating a new vehicle, which on the one hand issues bonds to creditors, which they'll be very happy to hold, because they'll be the liabilities of a European institution, which I could call, for example, a stability and growth bank. And this bank will, on the other hand, lend in flexible fashion to debtor countries like Spain and Italy. Now, it's maybe it quite complicated to try to do this uh, without a blackboard for an academic, that's a difficult thing. And um, to do this in a, in a large group. So the solution I've come up with is in fact a short play, to tell the story in the form of a, of a play. So I'm hoping that this is available for you all to see. Uh, the play is called How the Euro, How the Euro Was Saved. Now I've told you the, the, uh, the story, so in some sense we know the answer, but hopefully that will help you understand what's happening in the play. So, uh, it should be on the screen as we go along. Um, in fact, I believe I can control events from, from where I am. So let us start then uh, with, the, with the beginning. And, and it's scene one. So there's three scenes to this play, only one act and three scenes. The first scene is called Dreaming of Drowning. So, um, this, is, this takes place in a secret location in Europe where the heads of the 17 members of the Euro are discussing endlessly and fruitlessly what to do. The hope for the Euro has almost gone. The Economist magazine sees the currency, as you can see on the screen, as a falling meteor crashing into the earth in a ball of fire. For those who have looked for stability and harmony in Europe, this is a nightmare. It reminds me of that famous dream in, in Richard III, where the Duke of Clarence is pushed over the side of the boat by his brother, Richard, Richard III, who, as you know, is a very ruthless fellow. And as, as he sinks under the waves, uh, Richard III um, sees a thousand and he, he sees a thousand fearful rocks spread on the bottom of the sea. A thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, all scattered in the bottom of the sea. That's what he saw. Now I have the translation into Spanish, uh, for those of you who prefer your Shakespeare in Catajano. <laughs> uh, this is, these are the words of the Duke of Clarence. Me parecía ver mil naufragios espantosos, diez mil hombres devorados por los peces, dispersos en el fondo del mar. <laughs> for the Duke of Clarence, and this was a foretaste of his death, because within a few moments he was drowned in a barrel of wine. But what about the euro? Is it going to drown? in a sea of its own debt. So in despair, the leaders of the Euro 17 called before them three trusty advisors, an economist, a political scientist, and a lawyer. So let them speak. First, first of all comes the economist. Now he's a very orthodox economist, not like um, Professor Stiglitz, for example. <laughs> so he speaks. My name, my friends, is austerity. And if that fails, more austerity. <laughs> That's my advice. For Europe, in recession, in, in, in depression virtually, this is a council of despair. So they dismiss this economist. What does the political scientist say then? His advice is as follows. Forget democracy. Think technocracy. <laughs> Let the bankers take over the reins of power. They are our only hope. <laughs> well, since the bankers caused the crisis, this is no cure. This is massivism. <laughs> Finally, it's the turn of the lawyer to speak. I am a corporate lawyer, she says. 
You ask me how to save your own incorporated. My answer is bankruptcy law. That's how I see it. Oh no, cried the leaders of Europe. This must be the end. Like the outgoing kings of Arabia, we are to be sold for scrap. Not necessarily so, says the lawyer. And here's the reason why. If the continuation value of the euro exceeds its value as scrap, <laughs> chapter 11 of bankruptcy law may very well apply. <laughs> chapter 11? <laughs> we discussed. What about the start? But it explains to us all before it's too late. Is it something to love or something to hate? <laughs> So we come to scene two. Scene two is a technical scene. It's a scene in which we explain the meaning of chapter 11. It's in the same location after break for coffee. Because the two like are sitting out all night discussing this problem. Chapter 11 explains the young lawyer is to keep the creditors at bay. When times are bad, a company with good prospects asks a wise judge to swap its debt into equity, to pay more when times are better and less when they are bad. Of course, in Argentina, you know all about this, they're gold bonds, they're gold bonds. Well, sweet words, say the leaders of Europe, sweet words indeed, but stay. We are no companies. We are sovereign states. What about us? No matter, says the lawyer, for you, growth bonds will suit as in Argentina, you only pay when you grow. Oh, wise young lawyer, by the heads of Europe, go find us a judge. But hang on, if the creditors don't like these growth bonds, will the panic not resume? Well, there is another step along the way, says the young lawyer, that's true. But trust me in the learned judge, a man of great fame, um, his name is as good as King Solomon in his day. This leads us to Act 3, Scene 3, where this, this amazing solution makes an appearance. Now, the, the scene for this is a street in Frankfurt, and there's total chaos in the street. The, the, the creditors are besieging the banks, all trying to dump Spanish bonds and Italian bonds and get. German equivalent. So there's pa panic all over the place. And the chaos is growing. It seems to feed on itself. Like one of those mythical beasts that eats its own stomach. <coughs> so suddenly, thick mist falls upon the scene, bringing the mad bustle to a halt. Then, like messengers of the gods on the battlefields of ancient Troy, shadowy figures move among the crowd. And they take the bombs away from people's trembling hands. Then when the mist clears, the first thing you notice is this huge building in the, in the sky of Frankfurt. In a moment, you'll see a, an image of this amazing building. It towers above all the other commercial banks. And it has the word SGB written on, on the front. It stands for Stability and Growth Bank. <laughs> So, uh, so the, the panicking crowd, when the mist clears, see this building, and they cry, what does that mean, oh judge, SGB? Where are our, our old bonds gone? We didn't want them, but they weren't worth them. And what are these new bonds stuck in our hands? Pray silence, called the dark of the court. And listen to the judge. So the judge speaks. What you have in your hands are stability bonds, which pay coupons, just like Deutsche bonds do, just like German bonds. They are the liabilities of this great building, this new bank. Your old bonds, which you had before, have been, have been returned to the sender, like unwanted envelopes. And they've been replaced by national growth bonds. These are the assets of this building growth bank which give breathing space to the borrowers. So the Stability and Growth Bank is called what it's called because it offers stability to the 
people who've got their money in the bank, and offers growth to the borrowers. So that was the, the, the big event. And now they finish their job. The judge and his friend, the young lawyer, they leave the scene. And the creditors, in wonder at such a miracle, stay silent. Then they disperse. They all gain stability, and the debtors have got the opportunity to grow. Well, that was how the euro was saved, and the lawyer earned her fee. It was paid, apparently, in bonds of the SPB. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eh, incluso eh, la gente no bancaria tratar de, de, de reducir 
los descalzos de moneda, o sea que los pasivos en moneda extranjera, eh, o sea, en otras palabras, que solamente se permite endeudarse en el fondo a aquellos agentes económicos que tienen, eh, digamos, ingresos en moneda extranjera. Esto, este tema de la hoja de balance externo es fundamental, yo diría que el gran avance de América Latina fue haber eh, eh, reducido significativamente su endeudamiento externo neto eh, en, eh, durante la década pasada. De tal manera que hoy en día eh, prácticamente las, eh, eh, la deuda externa de América Latina está compensada por las reservas internacionales. Y eso es lo que le ha dado margen para hacer política monetaria anticíclica que nunca tuvo durante las crisis anteriores. Cuando vamos a hablar de, del manejo de la crisis, eh, eh, yo eh, mencionaría cuatro elementos y quiero ilustrar de, 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 de algunos de esos temas con, la, con algunas observaciones sobre la crisis eh, eh, europea. Eh, primero, tiene que haber políticas anticíclicas. En otras palabras, la, eh, eh, la, digamos, hay que hacer políticas de reactivación. Eh, las monetarias... Eh, eh, pero generalmente las fiscales son un complemento necesario, pero hay que tener una política fiscal anticíclica eh, eh, activa durante la crisis. Eh, ahora bien, eh, y esto es muy importante, el margen para hacerlo depende fundamentalmente de que se haya hecho política anticíclica durante el auge. Si no se ha hecho política anticíclica durante el auge, va a haber muy poco espacio para política anticíclica durante la crisis. Y ese es un tema eh, muy importante que lo hemos vivido en carne propia. Por ejemplo, en América Latina, en esta materia, hemos aprendido a medias. Muchos países siguen haciendo política procíclica, durante el auge, o sea, expandiendo el gasto público a ritmos que van a ser insostenibles eh, posteriormente. Segundo y muy importante, el financiamiento oficial. El, el financiamiento oficial se vuelve eh, esencial durante las eh, crisis porque no hay financiamiento privado. Eh, y esto es cierto no solamente a nivel internacional, sino también a nivel nacional. Por eso en la última crisis, eh, una de las grandes innovaciones eh, fue el uso activo de los bancos de desarrollo eh, como instrumento anticíclico a nivel internacional y a nivel nacional. O sea, el Banco Mundial, el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, la CAF, por ejemplo, en América Latina hicieron una gran expansión de su financiamiento durante la crisis al mismo tiempo que los bancos de desarrollo, los países lo utilizaron activamente con este propósito. Brasil, que es el que tiene obviamente el banco de desarrollo más grande, fue obviamente el actor más importante. Tercero, reestructuración de deuda si es necesario. Eh, que es el tema eh, que quiero, eh, por ejemplo, a mí me parece que el caso europeo simplemente lo va a mencionar, la reestructuración de la deuda eh, griega fue claramente insuficiente y genera un problema eh, hacia adelante y yo tenía la esperanza de que el caso griego eh, abriera la posibilidad de que la creación de un mecanismo formal internacional para la estructuración de deudas eh, que eh, desafortunadamente no se dio por la forma como se presentó la, el acuerdo relativamente a Grecia pero Grecia va a tener que tener otra reestructuración de deuda sí, mucho más ambiciosa eh, y bueno, y hay, y hay otros mecanismos eh, eh, para los países que son solventes, pero eh, que mencionaba Marcos en su presentación. Y, y, y cuarto me parece muy importante es no olvidarse de los ajustes de largo plazo. Las crisis tienen impactos duraderos y por lo tanto hay que ajustar eh, distintas partes del sistema económico eh, que en algunos casos es eh, asociados al gasto público. Eh, pero en otros casos a la estructura productiva, o sea, el, 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 las estructuras productivas eh, después de, la, de los auges eh, necesitan eh, una reestructuración profunda. Eh, generalmente los auges, por ejemplo, eh, dependen mucho de la propiedad raíz, las crisis no permiten eh, ese sector, eh, se hace evidente que hay una falta de competitividad en, en distintas ramas productivas, entonces la política industrial puede jugar un papel muy importante en inducir los cambios en la estructura productiva que se consideren convenientes. Dicho esto, déjenme eh, precisamente utilizar algunas de estas reflexiones para referirme al caso eh, europeo. Eh, el caso europeo es, es diferente al nuestro eh, en un sentido importante. Eh, la eurozona eh, maneja una moneda de reserva eh, hasta ahora, eh, y si no colapsa, eh, tiene una... Eh, tiene una moneda de reserva y por lo tanto el manejo de esa moneda de reserva 
eh, es un activo importante que, no tenemos, que nunca hemos tenido los países emergentes durante nuestras propias crisis. Entonces, la, 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 digamos, la, la forma como se maneja eh, 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 es eh, absolutamente esencial. Entonces, primero, eh, el margen para hacer política expansiva es mucho mayor eh, cuando se tiene una moneda de reserva. Por lo tanto, la, la austeridad como en la única ruta eh, es claramente equivocada. Pero dentro de la eurozona hay, hay situaciones diferentes y el problema principal no, eh, digamos, eh, eh, de alguna manera es eh, que Grecia tiene que ajustarse y España e Italia seguramente también tienen que ajustarse. Entonces la pregunta es cómo para la Eurozona en su conjunto hay eh, una compensación eh, del de la, de la, efecto recesivo de la austeridad con el efecto expansivo que generan eh, la, ya, las políticas expansivas en otras partes de la Eurozona. Y eso tiene dos dimensiones a mi juicio, la dimensión fiscal, eh, en otras palabras, eh, eh, Alemania e incluso Francia deberían hacer más expansión fiscal para compensar eh, la, eh, el efecto eh, eh, de ajuste, digamos, de, de los países de la periferia, pero igualmente importante salarial, eh, porque, digamos, tiene que haber un reajuste de los salarios relativos entre los países centrales de la eurozona y la periferia de la eurozona. Entonces, eh, eh, hoy en día prácticamente el único ajuste en, en curso es la reducción de salarios en la periferia. Se requiere un aumento de salarios en Alemania eh, y un aumento de salarios, digamos, en, en los otros países que tienen mayor fortaleza, en Holanda, en Francia, eh, digamos, en Escandinavia, eh, los países escandinavos, que son, eh, digamos, de eh, Finlandia, por ejemplo, ¿qué? que son miembros de la Eurozona. Eh, eh, por lo tanto, es ese paquete, eh, digamos, que, el que tiene que predominar y donde no se ve ninguna eh, eh, solución, y a lo cual agregaría eh, un paquete común de la Eurozona en materia de reactivación, el que anunciaron los eh, jefes de Estado a finales de junio, de 120 mil millones de euros, es demasiado ridículo en su tamaño para ser creíble, eh, en, en, y además no había instrumentos concretos, digamos, para ponerlo eh, en ejecución. Yo creo que lo, lo más importante del caso de, de, de la Eurozona sería hacer un gran paquete, una especie de plan Marshall eh, en particular para, para Grecia, eh, una, incluso para algunas regiones eh, europeas fuertemente recesivas, en recesión. Segundo, eh, Europa tiene un prestamista de Utenistax. Te la pregunta es cómo lo, lo utiliza, se llama el Banco Central Europeo. Entonces, eh, 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 ha estado funcionando bien para los bancos. O sea, el Banco Central Europeo ha provisto liquidez eh, en forma prácticamente ilimitada para los bancos. Pero no ha funcionado para los gobiernos. Entonces, la, la pregunta es, ¿debe hacerlo para los gobiernos? Yo diría, depende cómo lo plantea uno. Yo preferiría una solución eh, como la que, la, la que propone Marcos. ¿Por qué? Porque el, el símil sería que la Reserva Federal de Estados Unidos tuviera que comprar, en vez de bonos del Tesoro de los Estados Unidos, tuviera que comprar bonos de California, de Florida, de, ¿no es cierto?, de New York, eh, que no es, un, en práctica, no es lo que hace normalmente un banco central, porque no tiene que evaluar la, la capacidad, que, digamos, de, de repago de, de los estados, sino que simplemente se relaciona siempre con, la, con el Estado Federal. Eh, por eso la, la mejor solución sería que eh, hubiera un fondo de carácter estatal que es el que le da préstamo directamente a los países, un, digamos, un banco de la eurozona, como el que propone Marcos, eh, y eh, ese banco tuviera acceso al Banco Central Europeo. Entonces, para sus bonos fueran los que, eh, digamos, compra el bono y, y vende el Banco Central Europeo. Digamos, pero la falta de creatividad en esta materia, que es, eh, es, eh, es uno de los temas más eh, candentes en la eurozona, porque la peor solución es obligar, en, en condiciones en que los mercados no quieren dar crédito en cantidades adecuadas, obligar a los países eh, a ir eh, a, a los mercados a financiarse, Por eso, porque eso genera eh, una explosión de la deuda externa. Es un fenómeno que Argentina conoció antes de la crisis del 2001-2002 eh, y es un fenómeno que están conociendo España e Italia, digamos, de que sus coeficientes de endeudamiento están aumentando excesivamente eh, por ese motivo. Por lo tanto, digamos, la, la, la solución al tema de, de la deuda soberana, y más que la deuda soberana, al financiamiento de los gobiernos eh, dentro de la eurozona, me parece que es una solución, y me parece que la, el mejor mecanismo sería un banco o, o el mismo mecanismo de estabilidad ya creado para la eurozona, eh, y que el financiamiento que otorga 
tuviera como eh, contraparte unos, unos bonos, unos pasivos que emite y que sí pueden ser comprados abiertamente por el Banco Central Europeo para sus operaciones. Y por último, eh, eh, el, el tema de la, digamos, de, de la eh, eventual ruptura del euro. Yo creo que la, eh, la ruptura del euro sería una catástrofe internacional. Yo creo que sería una crisis eh, de mucho mayores proporciones eh, que la de Lehman Brothers, eh, porque sería el, el, el colapso de una moneda de reserva. Eh, no hemos conocido en la historia el colapso de una moneda de reserva como tal durante una crisis. O sea, uno puede decir que el abandono del patrón oro por Gran Bretaña en septiembre de 1931 fue eso, pero no, no fue eso. En realidad, Gran Bretaña prácticamente había dejado de ser la moneda de reserva desde la Primera Guerra Mundial. O sea, eso era como una etapa, digamos, avanzada de ese proceso. Y de hecho había abandonado el patrón oro durante la Primera Guerra Mundial. Entonces, eh, y, y, y además yo creo que en esta materia, en la falta de decisión sobre Grecia está generando los efectos que serían extremadamente perjudiciales eh, sobre el resto de la eurozona. A mí me parece muy difícil manejar una, eh, una salida de Grecia que no genere eh, una, eh, un efecto dominó, para ponerlo de esa manera, eh, que termine, o un contagio, digamos, eh, muy fuerte, que termine arrastrando otras partes de la eurozona y haga muy difícil la estabilidad de la eurozona. Por eso, eh, eh, y, y, y por ese efecto internacional, pero también por tres razones, Relativas a Grecia, eh, yo creo que es la mejor política para Europa es salvar a Grecia dentro de la Eurozona. Y, y voy a y termino con tres eh, diferencias fundamentales entre Grecia y Argentina eh, en el 2001-2002, que me parecen que son esenciales para entender por qué Grecia no es Argentina. Eh, primera, eh, Grecia no tiene su moneda nacional. Argentina sí tenía una moneda nacional cuando no la convertibilidad. Al otro día en Grecia nadie tiene con qué comprar nada. Digamos, hay un problema de, digamos, de transición, pero digamos, no es un problema irrelevante. Segundo, Argentina tenía un superávit fiscal primario antes de abandonar la convertibilidad. Es decir, cuando suspende el pago de, de, de la deuda, tiene cómo pagar su funcionamiento. Grecia no. Entonces Grecia al otro día tiene que, eh, el Banco Central griego tiene que emitir para las operaciones corrientes del gobierno eh, griego. Tercero, el sistema bancario eh, argentino no estaba quebrado eh, antes del abandono de la convertibilidad, claro, estaba en la situación débil, pero no estaba quebrado. Y era, eh, eh, en, en tamaño relativo, eh, eh, un 40% del tamaño del, del sistema griego. Digamos, en Argentina era digamos, un 30% del PIB, en Grecia es un 75% del PIB. Y además, el sistema bancario griego está quebrado. Eh, ya digamos, ampliamente quebrado. Entonces, la, 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 el, no es posible, digamos, replicar la situación argentina, digamos, este sueño de que abandonando la, digamos, la, eh, la eurozona, que entraría en un periodo de prosperidad, eh, 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 gracias a la devaluación de su nueva moneda, creo yo que eh, pierde de en mente, digamos, no solamente el impacto internacional que tiene eh, en la, una salida de Grecia del euro, sino que además ignora esas otras características. A mi, a mi juicio, la solución a la, a la crisis griega es diferente. Pasa por una reestructuración de verdad de su deuda, eh, ya que, digamos, en condiciones que sean sostenibles, y segundo, con un plan, una especie de plan marcha, un plan financiado por la Unión Europea que ayude a la reactivación de la economía griega. Eh, eso unido a las medidas más amplias eh, que permiten que haya otras zonas de la euro, eh, otras partes de la eurozona que tienen eh, una política expansiva y que compensa la política recesiva que tienen que tener eh, por su naturaleza las economías de la periferia europea. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Antonio. Y cerramos nuestro panel con el profesor Stiglitz, que se va a quedar apónico de hablar tanto de las actividades. Eh, no necesita más la presentación, pero simplemente voy a mencionar que, como todos ustedes saben, fue premio Nobel de Economía, eh, fue economista jefe del Banco Mundial, eh, es eh, profesor de la Universidad de Columbia y actualmente ocupa la presidencia de la International Economic Association, que es la organización que eh, organiza esta rama Así que, profesor Stiglitz, eh, lo escuchamos. Okay. Uh, I want to, uh, 
discuss this issue from uh, more of a global, international uh, perspective. Um, and I want to begin by, by emphasizing that uh, in thinking about debt crises, we want to think about the nature of the risk to which uh, countries are exposed, uh, how they adjust to the shocks, to the uh, risks that they face, and finally, uh, the uh, mechanisms to, for restructuring the debt, which uh, become an important part of the adjustment when other aspects of the adjustment uh, are insufficient. I know in my remarks by a, a few comments on the uh, focused on the eurozone crisis uh, in particular. Now, the uh, both the issue of the exposure to risk and the adjustments to change and to the risks that a country faces are affected by the institutions, the rules, the policies, and. Uh, so what I want to do is to illustrate uh, this general perspective that how institutions, rules, and policies affect both the exposure to risk and then uh, the adjustments uh, to the risk. I want to begin by talking in particular about how decisions about how companies and banks finance their debts and governments finance their debt affect uh, exposure to risk. In particular, one of the uh, major issues facing most com companies and, and countries is how to finance their debt. What is the currency in which they finance their debt? Uh, and it makes a very big difference whether you finance your debt in your own currency versus financing it in some other currency. And this has been a, a well understood as a fundamental problem facing developing countries. Uh, emerging markets. If they finance their debt in dollars or euros, then they face an important exchange rate risk. Uh, in a way, the fundamental mistake that a, one of the many fundamental mistakes that Europe has made is that it created a situation in which the individual countries were financing themselves in a currency, the euro over which they had no control. Uh, the contrast between the United States and Europe should be clear. Uh, the Europe's GDP rate, debt GDP ratio, their sense of indebtedness is actually lower than that of the United States. So if you've looked about it, forgot about the institutional arrangements, the details, you can say Europe is in a better position than the United States. But there's a fundamental institutional flaw. The United States, borrows in dollars. There is essentially a zero probability of default because what we do is we promise to repay the dollars and we control the printing press. So if uh, we have hard times, we just run those printing presses a little bit harder and we repay the debt that we owe. And that should make it clear, by the way, that when S&P downgraded the U.S. a year ago and said that there was a risk of default, that was a political act. It was not an economic judgment. Uh, it reflects the, the fact that the rating agencies are engaged very highly in politics, not in, in deep economic analysis. It's essentially a zero probability of, of, of default. But what Europe has done is created an environment in which Greece borrows in euros, but doesn't control the printing presses of euros and can't control the ability to, to repay its debt. It's borrowing in a, it's just in a foreign currency. It's controlled by Frankfurt, not by Athens. So they, they in a sense, put themselves in this uh, very difficult, uh, I would say almost impossible situation where they created the risk of default. Now, domestic firms within any country make a decision about whether to borrow in domestic currency or foreign currency. That decision itself creates externalities in others because when a country faces a shock, it will affect the uh, uh, volatility of the creditor. It could say, Okay, if we 
if we don't get an agreement that we, we, we can't borrow anymore, but maybe we're better off. Now, I said part of the issue here is uh, we need to look at this from the uh, uh, international perspective. And the question is, what, will, what would happen if this, uh, if, if the kind of deep restructuring that's associated with, was associated with the Argentine crisis became more common? Uh, some of the international financial markets say the consequence would be there would be less access to capital, short-term capital, and uh, higher interest rates. Well, that may be the case, although the evidence that that is the case is very limited. In fact, some of the discussion in our roundtable yesterday pointed out that after uh, defaults, countries do regain access to credit uh, fairly quickly. But even if it were the case, the point is, I want to go back to the point I mentioned a little bit earlier, that international borrowing does impose externalities on the rest of society. So having a little bit less international borrowing, at least, or perhaps considerably less, would actually be beneficial to society more broadly. That when individual, when corporations borrow in foreign currency abroad, they impose externalities, they impose costs on others. Uh, they tend not to take in, into account. I want to conclude with a, a couple of remarks about uh, the Eurozone uh, and the, the, the uh, possible end uh, of the Eurozone. Partly inspired by Jose Antonio's uh, comments. Uh, in my mind, I, I, I began my talk this morning by emphasizing that typically problems of debt, like those of, 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 of Greece and Spain and Ireland, are a symptom of a deeper problem. And so the just restructuring debt doesn't solve the deeper problem. Nor do I think a Marshall Plan would solve the problem. I think I'm, I'm all in favor of helping Greece and helping Spain, helping Ireland, perhaps. But uh, uh, the question is, um, uh, that doesn't solve the fundamental problems of the Eurozone. I believe that there are fundamental flaws. I mentioned one, the separation of, of the currency in which the lending occurs uh, uh, from the fiscal authorities. Uh, there needs to be a European-wide uh, framework, fiscal framework, which is more than an austerity pact, which is what the fiscal pact that they've agreed on. In the United States, two-thirds of all money that's uh, public expenditure occurs at the federal level. In Europe, it's about 2% or 3%. So it's very small. So that basically they have, to, if they're going to survive as a federation, they have to uh, have more of an economic federation. The second thing is, you cannot have a... Uh, uh, banking system inevitably backed by the government where it's each individual government that's backing it. You have to have a European-wide banking system with a European-wide deposit insurance and European-wide regulators. Thirdly, you can't have the kind of tax competition race to the bottom that characterizes uh, Europe today where Ireland's economic model is based on tax competition, trying to steal firms from other companies, not because it's providing better education or other uh, 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 infrastructure. That's a fair competition, but trying to get people there to locate there because they are uh, taxed uh, less highly. That's a race to the bottom which undermines the ability to have a cohesive society uh, and redistribution. There are a number of other flaws in the Euro framework that, that need to be addressed, but unless those are addressed, I don't think that uh, the Eurozone will be able to survive. It may be able to survive for another 10 or 15 years. And remember, you can say, if you want to take an optimistic view, look at the Bretton Woods Institution uh, framework that was created in 1944, only lasted until 1971, 
25, 35 years is a long time for a currency framework. The Eurozone will last for 30 years. We should be happy. But um, I think that the ambition of the European leaders is something that's more than a quarter century uh, uh, system. And uh, if they're going to have a, a, a European system, uh, it has to address these fundamental problems. Now, I do think that there will be some uh, 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 turmoil at the end of the uh, euro, that, that's clear. Uh, but let me comment first. It doesn't mean that the euro will disappear. It just means there will be different countries in the euro. So the reserve currency of the euro will still survive. The question is, which country should leave? Should it be Greece that leaves or Germany? And there's growing consensus among economists that the appropriate solution for the euro is to have Germany leave. That if Germany leaves, the rest of the euro, the true euro, will go down and the value will become more competitive. The current account deficits will be addressed. The current account surplus of Germany will also be addressed because its currency will go up. And that will be a sol a, 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 a help solve global imbalances at the same time. So um, that way of doing it would have the further advantages of, of needing less debt, restru debt restructuring, the kinds of, of difficulties that I described this morning that were associated with Argentina will be much smaller if Germany leaves than if Greece or Spain leaves. Um, so, uh, uh, whether this is, uh, uh, first of all, let me say, I think there's a broad consensus that the best solution for Europe is for Germany to stay, Greece to stay, Spain to stay, and for Europe to address the fundamental uh, structural problems at the European level. But if that doesn't happen, and certainly the politics right now suggests that there are, uh, it's not on the table, then we ought to be thinking about, Europe ought to be thinking about what is the least uh, the way of, of restructuring the Eurozone in a way that is most likely to have the least disturbance, not only for Europe, but for the global economy. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for being comprehensive with the time and limits. Uh, Los esperamos a las seis y media para aquellos que quieran asistir a la sesión de cierre pública hoy en el mismo seis por lugar. Hasta luego.